If you are a pathfinder or a young person that knows this song, I'd ask you to join me in singing. Oh, we are the pathfinder strong, the servants of God are we, faithful as we march along in kindness, truth, and purity. A message to tell to the world, a message to tell to the world. A truth that will set us free. King Jesus, King Jesus, the Savior is coming back for you and me. Village Church, if you love Jesus, can you say amen this morning? Amen. If you're happy at seven, can you say amen this morning? Amen. Praise the Lord. I've just been so blessed with the services thus far today. And I'm so happy as I see all these young people dressed spiffy in their Pathfinder uniform. Pathfinder strong. And I'm excited to see how God is going to bless us this afternoon as they show how much they've memorized from the Bible. And another reason why I'm glad this morning, as it has been mentioned several times thus far, I'm praising God that our village missionaries had arrived safely to El Salvador. And I really want to solicit this church to be praying for these missionaries today and throughout the week. Over 90 people are there, and they're dedicating their spring break for the service of God. And several of those others include our senior pastor, Pastor Ron Kelly, another pastor of ours, Pastor Dennis Page. So let's continue lifting him up in prayer as we go about the week. I also know that God has a, indeed a special, special blessing for us this morning. I have been praying for each and every one of you. As I've been going about the week, I've been praying for you, and even back there I have been praying for you. I do want to say I have been so encouraged also for those that have stopped me as I'm walking down the hallway or have sent me a message letting me know that you're praying for me. You know, it's so encouraging to know when someone's praying for you, amen? And so I want to encourage you, as you pray for people, let them know that you're praying for them. You never know how far that can go. And today is going to be a great day because, as always, on this pulpit, we take a great adventure through the Word of God. Yesterday, I was teaching the class for our fifth graders, and little Emily in fifth grade, as I was doing something with the fifth graders, little Emily said, Pastor, I want to tell you something. And she said, you know how the Bible says uh, uh, God is Lord of Lords and Kings of Kings? Well, she says, well, the Bible is books of books. And when she said that, that just brought a great smile to me. And this morning, we are going to study the book of books. And I want to state it from the very beginning. I pray that if you ever think that the Bible is boring, this morning will show you that the Bible is not boring. The Bible, the stories found in Scripture are living stories. The Bible is a living word, and I'm telling you, it's a great book to study. And so this morning, we're going to actually study into the Word of God, and I pray that everyone brought their Bibles. If you don't have your Bibles, there's some Bibles in front of the pew. But as I speak to you this morning, with the help of the Holy Spirit, keep me in prayer. With that being said, I'm going to say this morning's title, the, me the title for this morning's message, then we will pray. The title for this morning's message is entitled, From the Pen to the Home. One more time, it's From the Pen to the Home. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for allowing us now to be here. And Lord, please allow us not to hear words from a man, but allow us, oh Lord, to hear words from on high. Bless this time of worship Please send us a great measure of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, allow us to leave this place changed, renewed, and ever committed to you. This is my prayer. We love you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, we're going to take a great adventure through the Word of God. I would ask this morning that you would turn your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 15. Luke, the 15th chapter, and we will be entertaining verse 1. One, Luke, the 15th chapter, verse 1. And something I always do at, at, at the school when I'm teaching for Bible at our local church school, I always have my students say, look, when you're there, please let me know by saying amen. So Luke, chapter 15, verse 1, when you're there, please say amen this morning. Pra Praise the Lord, you guys are quick. Luke 15, the first chapter, this morning's message is entitled, From the Pen to the Home. And this morning, we'll be spending our time just looking at one parable. Now, I want us to remember that Jesus, through his earthly ministry on earth, had spoken many, many different parables. 
Students of Scripture may remember the parable of the ten virgins. You may remember the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, even the parable of the fishing net. But for those that may be tuning in to the, well, listening, reading the Bible for the first time or tuning into any spiritual uh, church service, a parable is simply a method Jesus used to teach heavenly truths. And these parables at times, he, he spoke stories, but also in these parables, he had oftentimes took object lessons from nature and he expounded on these things. But in Luke, the 15th chapter, there is about three parables. How many parables? Three parables. In Luke chapter 15, there is the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the parable of the prodigal son. Because of time today, we will look at one of those parables, and that is the parable of the lost son, the prodigal son. But some may question this morning, of all things that we could study today, especially with all the guests that we have, why would we look at the parable of the prodigal son? Well, I'm going to ask the media team to help me. Can you please put up our first slide with the first quotation? This quotation is taken out of the book, Christ's Object Lessons. What book, church family? Christ's Object Lessons, page 198. We're answering the question, why shall we dare even look at the parable of the prodigal son? It says this, the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son brings out in distinct lines God's pitying love for those who are straying from him. The quote continues, although they have turned away from God, it gets so hopeful, he does not leave them in their misery, praise Jesus. The quote continues, he is full of kindness and tender pity towards all who are exposed to the temptation as the elder prayed earlier, the artful foe. And the reason why I've decided to choose this parable to be the means of what we study this morning is because I believe, as everywhere in the Bible there are always practical lessons, this parable has practical lessons for us to take with us this morning. So once again, the message is entitled, From the Pen to the Home. We're looking at Luke chapter 15, verse 1. The Bible says this in Luke chapter 15, verse 1, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. But students of Scripture will understand that when there's a capital him in this part of the sentence, it's obviously speaking about the Godhead. In this specific sentence, it's speaking about Jesus himself. So Luke, in writing in chapter 15, says, All the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to hear him. And it's so beautiful to know that while Jesus was on earth healing, allowing the blind to see, allowing the lame to walk, people had a sincere desire to be in his presence and to hear him. You know, I was talking with a colleague the other day, I want to be just like Jesus, where no matter who is around, they always feel comfortable in my presence. Any person, no matter what their spiritual condition was, they felt comfortable to be in the presence of Jesus. And verse 1 explains that they came to him and also to hear him. Verse 2, we're getting context before we study the story of the, the prodigal son. Verse 2 says this, And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So as Jesus is fulfilling his ministry that his father has ordained for him to do, people begin to say, this Jesus guy, this guy from Nazareth has a, watch my fingers, problem. They begin to say that this problem that he has is he likes to be around sinful people. But I'm here to let you know, Village Church, I'm so thankful that Jesus has a problem of being around sinners because I don't know where I would be and I don't know where you would be. But let's see what happens as the story goes on after they're complaining that Jesus has a problem of being with sinners. I'm reading verse 3. He says, so he spake to them, he spake this parable to them saying. You know, Ellen White will write about Jesus that Jesus was the greatest teacher this world has ever known. Amen. Instead of rebuking them, calling these holy men by wrong things, Jesus says, you know, I won't even explain to you right now. I'll just give you some parables. And, and showing that, all right, if I have a problem of receiving sinners, I'll speak to you a parable. 
He speaks to them one parable. And just to ensure that they get it, he does another parable. And just to really ensure that they get it, guess what? He does a third parable, and that's what we'll be studying this morning. Remember, the topic this morning is from the pen to the home. And the note I want to throw out before we look at this parable, here's what's so beautiful about the parables of Jesus. People could always relate to them because he spoke of things they, they could see visually. But here's another beautiful thing about the parables of Jesus. Peradventure, Jesus would leave a city, guess what? If he spoke about the parable of the fig tree, whenever the, the person who had an open heart, whenever he looked at a fig tree, he would never see that fig tree the same ever again. He would remember the lesson that Jesus spoke when looking at that fig tree. Let's look at Luke chapter 15 and verse uh, 11, studying about this lost son. Luke 15 verse 11, the Bible says this, then he said, a certain man had how many sons, church family? Okay, you're with me. Praise the Lord. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portions of good that falls to me. So he divided, he divided to them his livelihood. Now this message will not be practical, friends, if you don't use your sanctified imagination with me as we dive into this story. I want you to imagine one household. In this household, there is a father and there is two sons. In this parable, nothing is mentioned about a mother, just a father and two sons. Later in this story, we will find out that this father was a pretty rich man. He was pretty well off. And I imagine as a rich man and as a man that's well off, he probably took good care of his sons. Whatever they needed, they had. Understand, I said whatever they needed, they had, not whatever they wanted, they had. Whatever they needed, they had. But one day, the younger of the two sons looks into the eyes of his father and says, Father, I am leaving today. And by the way, in our culture, we have an inheritance that I'm supposed to receive when you're dead. But on my way out today, I want to take it with me. Basically, what he's saying to his father is, look, I'm not only leaving, but I wish you were dead. So now I can imagine how heartbroken this father must be. All the hours he took in mentoring his children in this household, ensuring that they didn't get tangled with the evil influences of the world. Now his own beloved son says, look, I wish you were dead. Give me what's mine. But this father must be a loving father because he says, you know what? I'll give it to you. But I imagine he, just, he didn't just say, I give it to you like that. I imagine he probably wrestled with his son a little bit. Saying, son, you don't know what you're doing. Let's continue to find out how this story goes on. We're looking at Luke chapter 15 and verse 13. It says this, and not many days after... The younger son gathered all together, meaning all those belongings, all the things that were, that were once the father's, now his. He gathered them all together and journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. A few weeks ago while I'm studying this chapter, I always wondered what would cause the son to leave. He was well taken care of. What would cause him to leave? Media team, if you can please put our second quote on this morning. We're answering the question, what would cause this younger son to leave? She says this in Christ's Object Lesson, page 198, paragraph 4. This younger son had become weary of the restraints of his father's house. He thought that his liberty was restricted. Mm. His father's love and care for him were misinterpreted. He determined to follow the dictates of his own inclination. I'll break it down. He thought his father to be too strict. If I, he, he thought if I live under this household, my father would never allow me to do the things I want to do. But why are we studying that this morning? Part of me thinks that some of us in the house of God this morning may be living that same way. Some of us who are in the fold of God, we have a heavenly father some of us may be thinking this whole seven-day Adventist thing is too much for me. 
God is having, God is requiring me to eat a certain way. God is requiring me to dress a certain way. I'm tired of it. And just as the prodigal son seen it all to be restrictions, we may think this denomination and its rules to be restricting us. Mm. But then the son gets to the point where he believes that the world has something better to offer. I work heavily, heavily with the youth department. So first I'm going to speak to the young people. Never entertain the thought that the world has something better to offer. But I'd be a fool to only say that to the youth. Because the enemy rages after all ages. So the son now says, look, I'm going to be better off when I leave home. He packs all of his belongings. Imagine with, me, imagine with me now, the father probably pleads after his son, say, look, don't do this. The day comes. He says, I'm out of here. I can imagine the father's probably pulling him. No, don't go. He says, be with you. I'm going. The Bible goes so far to say that his son journeyed into a far country. Where he was going, he was ensuring that his father could not follow him. Where he was going, he was ensuring that no one could find him. In 2023, he would turn his phone off and maybe change his number. But as he goes to this far country, the Bible explains that he spent all of his belongings. With prodigal living, meaning wasteful living. Now he's out into the world. We will see later, and the next quote of media team can put that up there. We will see that he ends up meeting some friends. Christ Object Lessons, page 199. Evil companions helped him to plunge ever deeper into sin. And he wastes his substance with prodigal living, wasteful living. So as he goes into this far country, he meets some companions that think just like him. And what do we say now in 2023? Hey, it's your life. Do what you want to do with it. He meets some friends who think just like that. And they blow all of his inheritance. I wonder, are we entertaining the thought that the world has something better to offer? Or are we walking straight into the pig pen? Remember, this morning's message is entitled, From the Pen to the Home. Now he goes into this far country. He spends all that the father gave him, verse 13, verse 14. But when he had spent all, uh-oh, there arose a some severe what, church family? Famine. In that land, and he began to be in want. Well, let's see how the story continues to go on. Verse 15. Then he joined himself to a citizen of that country. And that citizen sent him into his fields to feed swine. Verse 16, and he would have gladly filled his stomach with the paws that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. So now he blows all of his living expenses. A severe famine comes into the land, and now he's on a search for jobs. He submits job applications. And the only one he can get is dwelling with the pigs. And I imagine, understand, Jesus is giving a parable. I imagine the scribes and the Pharisees, their mouths have probably dropped because Jesus is sharing the story to lots of Jews. And in their law, they're told to not eat the pig, but not even touch it. But now this son who was a Jew leaves the house of his father. Now he's found dwelling with pigs. That's the only job he can get. But the Bible goes so far to say that he gets tempted to eat what the pigs eat. <laughs> From the pen to the home. It's just like the enemy to lure you into his temptations. But then when it gets tough, he leaves you. Because now I, run, I wonder, where are, where are those companions that were helping him to do what he wanted to do? Those companions aren't in the pig pen with him now. He's by himself. Nor are his companions helping him through this severe situation. 
I'm really worried if the church, if the saints of God are starting to give in to this temptation that the world has something better to offer. But here's the hope about it. I won't even go there yet. I won't even go there yet. Because I, I, I praise the Lord that the story doesn't end there where the son is just in the pig pen. Praise Jesus that, that we know where the story goes on. But follow with me now. So often the temptation may be, oh, well, I want to get a grand testimony like those guys who were, were born in the faith, but then they left. They got, they got into drugs. They got into gang violence. They got into all of these things. And then they came back to the church. I want to get a grand testimony like that because being a seven-day Adventist faithfully all my life is not a great one. But I'm here to let you know right now that while the world may say that experience is the greatest teacher, I'm here to let you know this morning, only a fool has to learn that way. Learn to learn from other people's experiences. Learn to learn from one another's lessons. We live in such an evil world. We all have lessons to share. We don't have to go out playing around with the pigs, young people and pathfinders and everyone here this morning. We don't have to play with the pigs. We don't have to have that grand testimony where we went to the world and God reeled us back. We need more Daniels who stayed into the faith all the years of his life. We need Nehemiahs who never departed from the Lord. We need the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who will stand firm even if it means death. But while that is true, I want to encourage each and every person today because I have family members who are playing in the pen of this world. But guess what? Praise Jesus that there's hope beyond this story. Because the next verse says this, and I'm going to read just part of it. Verse 17 says this, but when he came to himself, meaning as he's in the pig pen, he realizes that he hits rock bottom. He begins to reflect and think. But I'm here to let you know this. That Jesus still tries to reach those who are in the pig pen of this world. If you don't believe me, I'll show you. I pray that you guys grab the bulletin as you walked in. Open your bulletins with me to page three. And we're looking under the category where it says reflect in Christ. A couple days ago, I sent this to our church sector to have this quotation on the bulletin this morning. Page three, reflect in Christ. It's under the page, family, Mat- family Matters. This quotation comes from the book, Steps to Christ. And before I read it, I want to encourage each and every person today, if you have not read Steps to Christ, read that book front to cover. That is a yearly read for me right now. And I will tell you, each and every time that I read it, it's a fulfillment for me. I find myself indeed taking many steps closer to Jesus. But this has been my favorite quotation from that book. You're looking on the reflecting Christ. This is Steps to Christ, page 26. She says this, Christ is the source of every right, what? Mm, I'll stop there. Meaning any desire to do good that comes from Jesus. Meaning when you are in the pen of this world and you have this desire to come back to God, that's already a manifestation of the Holy Spirit trying to reach you. But I I just had to stretch the point, so I put some more senses in there. She says, every desire for truth and purity and every conviction of our own sinfulness mm, is an evidence that his Holy Spirit is moving upon our hearts. I'm here to let you know, while we may have family members who are playing in the pen, do not ever stop praying for them. Never give up praying for them. There is a Holy Spirit that is reaching after sinners who are still in the pen of this world. And it's so hopeful to know that while this prodigal left everything, the Bible says that, but when he came to himself. Message is entitled, From the Pen to the Home. Verse 17, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to eat and to spare, and I perished with hunger. Remember earlier I was saying that the father was a rich man. Well, if a person has servants, he must have money to pay these servants. So now this young man is in the pen saying, look, if 
my father has all these servants and they have food to eat, why am I staying here starving? In the home of his father, he thought he was a slave, but many times I ask that you put the next quotation up. This comes from Christ's object lesson, same chapter, page 200. In the home of his father, he thought he was a slave, but check out what happened when he was in the pig pen. It says this, the youth who has boasted for his liberty now finds himself a what, church family? A slave. He is in the worst of bondage, holding with the cords of his sins. In his father's house, he thought he was a slave, but while he's in the pig pen, he sees that really I wasn't a slave at my father's house. I was a son. It's here while I'm playing with the world. I'm a slave. Amen. Listen, when you're in the house of your Jesus, you're not restricted. Amen. His word, his laws are for your best own interest. It's for your own good. But dwelling with the things of this world is playing around with pigs, literally. So he came to himself. He began to reason with himself. If my fathers have servants and they have food to eat, why dare I starve here where I'm not making a single dime? The next verse goes on and says this, verse 18. He says, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no, lo no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Look, I want you to use your sanctified imaginations this morning. He's in the pig pen. He reasons with himself. As he's in the pig pen, he begins to prepare his own sermon that he's going to preach to his father, appealing for his father's heart. He begins to practice. I imagine as he's in the pen, he's like, all right, the minute I see my father, I'm going to say this, 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 and this. But I wonder, how many of us try to do the same thing with Christ? Where when we're trying to go back to God, we're trying to prove ourselves worthy as the prodigal son tried to do. He tried to prove himself worthy. How I know that? Listen, he tried to prove himself worthy. He said, look, Father, I've done this. I have done that. Would you at least just please accept him back as a slave maybe? A quick thing I want us to notice is this. There must have been some, he must have still realized that his father s somehow would have still loved him even though he did his father wrong because he still had this desire to go back home. But also to some degree, I think he still misunderstood how, how much the father really loved him. How the, the father would love him like grace that is greater than all sin. And at times I wonder, do we do the same thing? Where God puts it in our hearts to come back to him, but we wonder, will he really accept us? Then we begin to prepare this grand speech Say, when I go to Jesus, I'm going to say this, this, and this. Now understand, please forget not, the path to redemption includes confessing our sins. But confessing your sins is not what makes you worthy to be a son of God. You're not getting it. I'll make it like this. The son did nothing to be called a son by his father. When a baby comes into this earth, they do nothing. But we love them naturally. Why? Because they're a child. Literally, the first thing they do when they come out is cry. But we still love them. I'll make it plain. There is nothing that you can do in your own power that will make you be, to be worthy to be a son or daughter of God. Not a single thing. But God loves you because he created you. That love is there no matter what you do. So you don't have to create this grand fancy speech to try to get Jesus to love you. Guess what? He does. And if you're questioning that, look at the cross. The Bible says for a while we are yet sinners. Christ, finish it for me, church, died for us. So if you're struggling with the pen of this world, don't try to prepare this fancy speech to try to get God to accept you. Please know if you take one step towards the master, he reaches out for you. 
And this desire to go towards the master already shows he's working in your heart because Christ is the source of every right impulse. So the story goes on. He prepares this grand speech. He, he starts walking home. I imagine that all of a sudden, maybe his companions probably came out of the bushes saying, hey, where are you going? Don't go back home. You probably enjoyed it here. What am I saying? While we leave the pen of this world, the enemy may try to press discouragement upon us on not having us go back home. He may try to discourage us saying, look, you, you did all that. You think your heavenly father would accept you? I mean, look at you. Your clothes are dirty. You smell like a pig. But I praise the Lord that this son did not care about that. He went home. He focused on the journey that was set before him. And so as he's going home, we read from the scripture that his father saw him afar off. And here's what I want you to understand. That father must have still been hoping that his son would come back. Because the Bible says that his father was watching afar off. Meaning in the distance, his father was still hoping that one day his son would come. And the minute that he sees his son coming, he doesn't just go back into his home. But the Bible says that his father ran towards him. And understand this, we won't get it because we're not Jews per se. But in the Jewish culture, an authority figure would not run. Why would an authority figure run to someone that's lesser than them? But this father leaves whatever he was doing and he runs towards his son. And as he gets towards his son, the Bible explains that the father hugged him and even kissed him. Realize with me now, his clothes was dirty and he probably smelt like pigs. But this rich man ran, ran towards him, hugged him, and kissed him. Verse 20, and he rose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Hallelujah. Verse 20. Listen, now the son begins his speech. Verse 20. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Verse 22. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe, then put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. You will read from Christ's object lessons. As the son begins to give his speech, the father literally interrupts him. The second time, the son didn't have, to, didn't have time to say, accept me back as a slave. The minute he began confessing his sins, the father said, look, put a robe on this man right here. Put sandals on his feet, implying that though he left home with shoes on his feet, he came back barefoot. So as he's given this grand speech, the father literally interrupts him and says, don't speak like this. I'm happy that you're back. <laughs> From the pen to the home, Jesus is happy when we leave the pen of this world and go back home. So he confesses his faults before his father. And the father says, look, that nice robe I have at home, servants, put that on him. Those sandals that were mine, put that on him. This ring signifying that, look, I'm, I'm accepting you back as my son, full in authority. Put that on him. Even while he may be smelling and looking like a pig, look, he won't look like a pig no longer. He's my child again. From the pen to the home. I praise God that as we studied earlier, the, the, the scribes and Pharisees were saying that Jesus had a problem accepting sinners. Listen, I praise Jesus that he has that problem. I praise Jesus that when he sees us coming back to him, he doesn't say, look, go back to the pen. He says, come back home. But I wish that the story ended there. But the story continues to go on. Now the son has sandals on his feet, has a nice robe girded about him. Let's see what the father decides to do. Verse 22, but the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Verse 23, and bring the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. He's saying, look, let's celebrate that our son is back. Verse 24, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. 
And the Bible goes so far to say, and they began to be merry. Meaning, this bond that was broken for us, however long he was gone, they're happy once again. Verse 25. If we could have stopped the sermon there, I would have been content. But the story still goes on, so we're going to go verse by verse still. Verse 25, the Bible says this. Now his oldest son was in the field. And as he drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. Verse 26, so he called one of his servants and asked, what do these things mean? Verse 27, and he said to him, your father has come, I mean, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. And I imagine a loving brother would say, oh, praise the Lord that my, my brother's back. But let's see how Jesus speaks this parable to happen. The parable, the parable goes on so far to say, verse 28, but he was angry. He was so angry to the point that he would not go in the house. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So a party is, ha a celebration is happen happening at the home of the father. The older son is working in the field, obeying the command that his father probably told him that, day, hey, look, go work on my field. And as he comes back, he hears music, he hears people laughing and praising God. He begins to wonder what is going on. I didn't get an invitation to this. The servants come out and explain to him. He gets upset and says, you know what? I was planning to go inside and probably rest for the day, but I'm going to stay out here. Probably the servant probably goes back home, goes back inside, speaks to the father. The father says, why, why, is, why is my son acting like this? So he goes out and speaks to him. And the Bible says that the father pleaded with this older son. Pleaded. Saying, son, look, let's be happy. Your brother is back. We'll see what lessons we can learn from this as we continue going. Verse 27, he said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received them safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. Verse 28, but he was angry. Let's go to verse 29. So he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never, you see pride coming in here. I never transgressed your commandments at any time. And yet, there was pride. Now you start to see comparison. Understand, there was a fatted calf that was slain for the son that came back. Let's see what happens. And yet, you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. Verse 30, but as soon as this son of yours came, oh mercy. He doesn't even recall him as a brother. He says, as soon as this son of yours came. Verse 30, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fat calf for him. Verse 31, and he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. Verse 32, it was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. The father probably expects that his son would join him in rejoicing, but his son does not. Here's the difference between the father and the son that stayed in the, in the house. The son, yes, he quote-unquote obeyed the commandments of the father, but in Christ's object lessons, you'll learn that the son only obeyed the commandments of the father for the inheritance that he would get once his father died. He obeyed simply just for reward. So when the son left, guess what? He didn't really care. If anything, he probably got excited. Saying, look, if, if anything else comes to my father, I know he's going to give it to me because I'm the only son that actually stayed. He did not join his father in the anxious, anxious search for his beloved brother. So of course he wouldn't join his father in being glad that his brother came back to the fold. What am I trying to say? 
I believe that right before Jesus comes, a true revival, I'll say it again, a true revival will happen where Jesus calls sinners to leave the pen of this world and calls them to come home. But have mercy if we're the ones saying, look, why would you allow them to come back? Have mercy if we're the ones complaining, look, don't accept them back. I, quote, unquote, never left the fold. I mean, that's how we can act when we want, when we start to forget that the grace of God was also applied towards us. Amen. We begin to say, Lord, I never did anything wrong, quote, unquote. But the minute this person came back, all of this started happening. Church family, I pray that when that true revival comes, our doors and our hearts are ready to receive those who are ready to leave the pen of this world. But I also want to ensure I don't, I, no one leaves the this, this, this sanctuary with this mindset of this thing called cheap grace where we just stamp grace on everything. Because understand, while Jesus yearns after the heart while they're in the pen, guess what? Praise Jesus, he doesn't leave people in the pen. He takes them out the pen. A heart that really receives Jesus in the full gospel, guess what? Begins to take steps away from the pen and goes home. They still, they don't just dwell with the pigs and say, Lord, stamp grace on me. If you really accepted the grace of God, you begin to live how Jesus would have you to live. Amen. So I can imagine that now that the son is accepted back, guess what? He doesn't complain with the father's commands. He says, you know, I began to realize my daddy loved me. I fell into the temptation that the world has something better to offer. But guess what? That was a lie. And I'm ensuring that any young person in the house this morning knows that that is a lie from the enemy. Thinking that this world has something better to offer us. But as you get on that way back from the pen, please be not discouraged. Come back home. And understand this, the church is made up of fallen human beings. So at times people may discourage you, but don't let that get to you. You know, a couple weeks ago, I was, I was on the internet and I seen this post that just made me sad. Some of my young friends were saying, look, I left the church, but I didn't leave God. Understand this, when you accept Jesus, you accept the body as well. Amen. You accept the family of God. And you accept knowing that, look, at times you may rub against one another, but be not discouraged. We all need grace applied to us. We all have, have, at some point, have gone away from the pen. And at times along the journey, there still may be pig mess on us. But Jesus is willing to say, look, put the robe on him or her. So don't be discouraged. Press on. If we're going to be together in the last days, we need to be together now. If we're going to be together in heaven, we need to be together now. So don't, don't, don't give us this thing of, look, I left the church, I didn't leave God. When you're with God, you're with his church family. From the pen to the home. But at times, we also may get discouraged thinking, well, does the Father really accept me knowing all that I have done wrong? Media team, I'll ask that you put the slide that has the verses up there. I'm going to read a couple verses to you this morning. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 22, it says this. You can claim these promises. If you need to take photos of these, take them. If you need to write them down, take them. Helping you to understand that like, no matter what, Jesus has forgiven you. Says Isaiah 44, verse 22. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgression. And as a cloud, thy sins. Jeremiah 31, 34. I will forgive their iniquity, says the Lord. I will remember their sins no more. Isaiah 55, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy unto him and unto our God. For he will abundantly pardon. Jeremiah 50, verse 20, In those days and in that time, says the Lord of hosts, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for. Listen, and there shall be none. And the sins of Judah shall not be found. When you're questioning whether does God really accept me, can God really blot me out of sins, guess what? The Bible says so. And he goes on to say, look, I will remember them no more. So I won't be bringing up the past when we used to dwell around with pigs. Getting ready to close this morning, I really want to encourage us that, look, 
a truth, a time will come where Jesus will call all of us to even go out and reach for those who are dwelling in the pen to come back home. And I pray that we are ready for that special moment and hour. I also want us to understand that if we look to Calvary every single day, pride and self-esteem will never find its way into our hearts and into our lives. Because we remember that it was that grace that took us out of the pen. And it's that grace that we need to apply to others as they're on their way back. In closing, I want to read the quote that we read when we first started off today. Media team, you can put the last slide. It says this from Christ's Object Lessons, page 198. The parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son brings out in distinct lines God's pitying love for those who are straying from him. Did you see that this morning? It goes so far to say, although they have turned away from God... This almost makes me cry a little bit. He does not leave them in their misery. He is full of kindness and tender pity towards all who are exposed to the temptation of the artful foe. May we be ready to accept those leaving the pen and says, look, I want to go home. And I want to encourage any young person, any person, no matter what age you may be, if you are still dwelling around with the pen, come home. Or if you are tempted to think that this whole Adventist thing, I need to give it, give it up because it's too much, do not believe in that lie. Because going out into the world just leaves you to dwell with pigs. Let us consecrate our lives to Jesus every single day. And let us be ready for that hour when he comes to receive us all. Dude, are, you, are you happy for Jesus to come and receive us all? Praise Jesus. With that being said, let us stand for our closing song this morning.